Hi. Hello. Right, no pressure then. This morning I was doing a dry, my last dry run through, and it was just me and my dog and a conservatory in the garden. So this is a little bit more um, daunting. So let's get started. So my talk is called Ink and Pixels, and it's about uh, mainly about, partly about my graphic design practice as IMEUS, which is I, me, us. Um, and partly about a film that I've been making the last two years with two close friends called Major Look, about cre creativity in the digital age. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, but first I just have to get something off of my chest. I don't blog. <laughs> okay. You laugh, that puts me at, at ease. Okay. So I, I, don't, I don't blog, and when I was first asked to do this, I, was, I just thought, is this right? Like, well, these people are going to be expecting something from me that maybe I can't, I can't do. And then I thought, what you all do is you share things. You're passionate about things. You collect things. You sh and then you share them online, and you just collect bits of culture and bits of cultural ephemera, or bits that you see from everyday life, and you share them. And that's kind of what we have in common. I mean, a, a film is just a different form of a blog. I took, we took a load of ideas. We threw them in. It wasn't quite that haphazard, and it took a long time. But... It's the same difference, it's the same end. You just want to share things and then you hopefully want to make a, a career out of it. Brilliant. This is me. I thought, I thought we don't blog. What else do we have in common? We were all children once. <laughs> and uh, it's not a bad start. Um, so there's a couple of me here. And I'm rocking some hot pants there, which I think have been back in fashion for a couple of years. So I, was doing, I think I'm about to throw some mud in my uh, brother's face there as well. <laughs> Uh, this is me again, with the worst haircut known to man. That's a home cut, that is. That's, uh, my mum just did that, and I think she got tired and didn't want to do the rest. And, yeah, so I don't even know why I'm sharing this stuff now. It feels like a big mistake. And then, this is the last one of me as a kid. Come on. There it is. Yeah, this is that stage when your big teeth come in, but your head hasn't grown to accommodate them. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't, know, I, I don't know why I shared these. I think it was because I was so fearful that you'd lynch me for not being a blogger or something. <laughs> so, this is the first record I ever yeah. bought. <laughs> I'm a little bit ashamed of it, but... Um, about 1987, I bought this for my mum on, on Mother's Day. But secretly, I really... <laughs> So I, I didn't put it in there for that response. So I, I um, secretly I kind of wanted it for myself at that age. I had like Wet 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 and Jason Donovan all over my wall. And, yeah. Um, and, uh, and I used to go into the hairdressers and I used to um, take a picture of Jason Donovan and say, cut it, cut it like that. Go on, cut it like that. So talking about my mum, I'm from a one-parent family. Uh, my dad left when I was about five. And I haven't seen him since. We grew up in a council estate, just me, my mum, and my brother. But don't get the violins out, because it's really not that kind of story today. It's about the idea that we struggled. We struggled really hard, but we had so much fun. And life was like, really good, and we're really close. So I never felt like we were struggling. We, we, uh, like I said, we just played out in the woods. We played up in the field, went down to the seaside, grew up on the, on the south coast. And life felt really, really good. But we didn't have much in the way of resources at all in the home. So you were kind of expected to go on and do something with your set. To go and, you know, when, when people left school, they went on to do factory jobs and things like this, which is what you have to do at a certain stage. But a lot of people, that was all they felt they were worth. So I don't know who remembers, uh, it's a bit random, but I'll get to it. I don't know if you all remember careers advisors at school. So. Our local economy was um, mainly built around a Kenwood factory in Haven. And uh, so you'd go to your careers advisor and they'd say, what do you want to be when you leave school? And I'm like, yeah, I want to be an artist. I want to be, when I was a little kid, I wanted to be an archaeologist, but I wanted to be an artist. So I was like, I want to be an artist. And they sat there for a second and pondered and looked, looked through some paperwork. And then they said, you know what you should do? You should go work in the Kenwood factory. <laughs> That'd be a really good job for you. Um, and I thought, no, no, you're really not getting it. I want to be an artist. And so there was this expectation at school to be pushed into the local economy. And I kind of rejected that. I decided, why would I spend my life doing something for you guys when you're not even prepared to listen to me? Uh, so instead, I decided to become an art student <laughs> a long, long time ago. Um, and from the household we were in, not having had very much, 
This was really, I mean, it was the last years of grants and loans. It was a really tricky thing to do because I knew that at the end of it, there was no definite path for me to go to. So I did the, the thing that wasn't expected of me because it was what I wanted to do. And then last year, um, this lovely lady, the education secretary, said that choosing to study creative subjects at school could hold you back for the rest of your life. And she said, <laughs> it is a pantomime. <laughs> and uh, this, this, uh, this started me remembering the story of the toaster, the fact that I, I was told I should make toasters. And she was saying, I think it might be a slight misquote, but over the course of your life, you'll earn 10, 15, 20% less than somebody who chooses to do an academic thing at school. And I, this it just reeked of that sort of trying to service the economy rather than what the individual wants and what the individual can offer to the, the world at large. And um, so between the, the, the toaster story and this, I just thought, you know, people really don't have a chance. Sometimes you don't realize what you're expected to do and what you want to do are two totally different things. And so many people do what they're expected to do. So after art school, couldn't really find a job as such did some temping, everybody does, and then sort of fell upon d doing graphic design. And uh, this is what it looks like to earn 10% less, but it makes me incredibly happy to do this stuff. So I've worked with Shortlist, I've worked with GQ, New Scientist, Slimming World, I've worked with all kinds of places doing um, editorial work. I've done my own prints, which have sold really well. There's my Alpha Boobies font there. It's an incredi incredibly good seller, that one. And then there's, of course, up on the right. Both of those sold out within hours of going on, online. Uh, the, the Alpha Boobies one sold to everybody as well. It wasn't gender specific. Or, and I, now I've made one that's called uh, Milkshake, which is a bit of a, for Alpha Boobies too. Anyway, look it up. Uh, <laughs> and I get to do stuff like this. I'm not earning as much, but I get to do loads of screen prints. I'm just always getting inky and messy. There's a couple more. And paper cuts and branding. I've done to loads of branding. This is a really lovely girl that I used to work with who came to me and said, you know, can you help me out with the branding? And I just like, I love what she does. And she's gone nuts. And my work's kind of plummeting because I've been making this film. She's gone absolutely wild. Everybody loves her work. Did t-shirts for a kids company. That one's called Make Art Not War on the, the right. No, left, yeah. It's because it's behind me. Um, and then uh, stuff for Aikido magazine. I do loads of stuff with them. Oh, whoa, there you go, whoa. <laughs> That's because I was too, uh, I'm a little bit nervous, so I'm pressing this button, like, come on, button. Uh-oh, <laughs> now I've broken it. Oh, hold on, I think I'm nearly there. I think I'm back to it. <laughs> You'll see all this again in a minute. Uh, <laughs> And they, can, and they can edit these bits out as well, I'm sure. So, all right, please stop. Please stop now. Okay, so I made apps with uh, some app makers. It was so much fun. I was a total hero to my kids. And now they've totally grown out of them, and they're a bit embarrassed by them. But at the time, these were, <laughs> these were top five in the app store, I think, for only a few weeks in the US and the UK. And I really had so much fun making these. And this is what it looks like to do to not do what's expected of you. And I didn't, I'm not making as much money as if I'd done something academic, but this is what it looks like to not go down that path. So I'm currently working on a book. These are mock-ups. Uh, and I'll be launching an exhibition later this year in Sargent Paper in Paris, where I'll be, hopefully, we'll have the book all published up, and we'll be doing a set of prints on movie doubles. I'm just sort of bringing together movie doubles. I'm going to do 100 movie doubles, so 200 illustrations. God knows why I ever decided to, but I love films, and I love doing this kind of stuff. So it keeps me busy when I don't have a million other things to do. So, uh, a couple of years ago, I was working with Print Club London, Film 4, and Somerset House on their summer screen exhibition. And what they do is summer screen shows the films in the courtyard, and Print Club London does an exhibition for the films. And they gave me Raising Arizona, which I didn't mind at all. I loved the film. Really wanted to be doing the piece on the right, but they decided to do the one on the left instead. So I'm totally happy with that. I'm totally down with that. But while I was there, they were interviewing all of my design heroes who were part of the show, and they were interviewing them in an echoey room, and just, I realized all of these people made up a bigger story, and that nobody was telling the story of the sort of DIY creative culture in the UK post-2000. And I just thought, well, I know 
people I could pull together a crew and maybe we could tell this film as a documentary. And so I left Print Club. They made this 15-minute film. That it, you know, it did what it needed to, but it wasn't, it wasn't telling the story. It was just telling the story of this show. And I immediately went to these guys. This is a 12-year-old photo. And we had a little meeting. And one is um, Paul O'Connor, my co-director. The other is David Waterson, who is our producer. And we've done loads of things together. But Paul is um, a... Uh, he runs a video editing company and does corporate films. And David works for London Boroughs, well, used to, he's quit now to do this, um, do it, programming films into film festivals and things like this. And I went to them and I said, oh, I've got this idea. And I expect them to tell me I was insane. And we met up in Brighton and the fog rolled in and we couldn't see anything and I probably should have taken it as a sign. And we discussed this idea and immediately they were like, yes, let's, let's do it. We didn't know that we'd be throwing two years of our life into it, but we had to start something. In order to speak to these people, we had to look kind of professional. So we started a company called Look and Yes, the idea being that as we're going to be doing this as an aside from what we normally do, we only want to do projects where when you look at something, you immediately say yes. You just know that's what you want to do. You don't um and ah, you don't talk about why you should or shouldn't do it. You immediately just go ahead and do it. And hopefully we'll do more and more like this, but we had to look kind of professional in order to approach all of these people in the first place. You know, you have to prove yourself all the time in everything. You have to prove why someone should let you do something. So I'm going to show you the trailer, and then I'll talk about the film afterwards. But just so you get some context for what the film's about, here's the, the trailer, hopefully. The most profound youth revolution that I've seen in the last 10 years has been a graphical one. And it's a very empowered revolution, and it says, I don't need to go and get a job. I'm going to make my own stuff. I'm going to use my own talents and support myself. And screw you, system. People like Kate Morris, Anthony Burrell, they are massive brands in themselves. People not only buy their artwork, but people want them to come and do lectures. People want them to like, be brand ambassadors of things not even related to the creative field. The actual use of tools that allow people for cheap or themselves to make, manufacture, distribute, sell themselves and their ideas, their music, their work, whatever, is, is what I care about. So I used to everything being perfect and things on screen being very seductive and lush and glossy. I think there's something really good about making a physical piece of work, be that a painting, a print, and you're kind of leaving an artefact really. People have had their fill of the digital world. If everything that we create, if that just exists in a digital cloud, then I think that's an incredible shame. You don't throw away books, you, know, you don't throw away prints, you know, there's something that you keep forever. I guess it's a metaphor for, you know, for the sort of digital revolution and the internet, where we need to print more books and make more prints. There probably was once a time where you, you had to, you know, you had to be in a city to communicate with, with people, you know, but now I can communicate and collaborate and create with people all over the world from a small town in the country. People aren't stuck doing one specific thing anymore. You don't have to just be an illustrator or just be this or be that. You can work and together and do so many different things. There's so many people wanting to do something, but there's not as many platforms. So let's try and make our own. Let's play around a bit more. Let's experiment a bit more. Let's work together. Twitter's a little bit like shouting into a cupboard or talking to a cupboard and you're like, no one hears you, no one cares. Doesn't need a retweet. He said, doesn't need a retweet. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, sorry. Thanks, thanks for the applause. I, he's really funny, Ian, so I wanted you to get that, but maybe we need to re-edit that. I don't know. Uh, so yeah, so that's, I think you can see why my talk fits with what you do from that. Um, I'll talk about the rest of the digital side later, but people like Ben talking about being able to do what he does from in, from near Bristol, from Froome in Bristol. Froome, Froome? I can never say that properly. Uh, he, he's able to do that 
he's able to do everything he can because he's got the internet right there. So I'll come back to that tension later, but there's a lot there that I think relates to everything you guys are doing or want to do. So this is partly what the beginnings of making a film look like. So we had to put together a treatment, a mood board, uh, all of the questions, the call sheets, everything that would persuade people that we were professional. Um, and so I got an email ready with all of this stuff ready to go in case people asked for it. And we got 17 emails, and I texted um, Charlie and Connor and said, are you sure you want to do this? Because I really respect lots of these people, and they don't even know who I am. And if we start and then we fail, then it looks really bad for me on the other side of my career as well. So, and they came back straight away and said, yeah, let's, just, let's go for it. No issue at all. So I sent out all these emails. And the first one I sent out to is Anthony Burrow, who's one generation before me and is a, is, was quite a hero of mine. He still is, but now I kind of know him, so it's a bit different. Um, and straight away he came back and said, do you have a treatment? I was like, yes. Sent him the treatment, and straight away he came back and said, I'm in. And everybody in the film, by one person, everybody we asked, said yes, because they could all see the value in showing this scene to a wider audience. So this is us at It's Nice That. I'm just showing off now. Um, <laughs> But this is just showing the process. So there were four of us on a few shoots. Most of the time, there were three of us. It was me, Connor, who was the technical director. I was the content director. And then um, we had a DOP. And then Dave was there a lot of the time taking photographs on set. And then this is me with Pete Fowler. I am literally just showing off now. Uh, so, this is, so we got all the footage. We, we did all the shoots, went to see everybody over the course of a year, because we had to fit it in around parenthood, around other jobs, our own jobs. And we got all the interviews over the course of the year. And this is what, if you're a graphic designer, you make an edit look like. Um, I think my editor wasn't that keen on it. I think he had his own system. But I was quite keen to use this. <laughs> Lots of color coding. I love stationery. So it's almost like a post-it note kind of thing. Loved doing this. Absolutely loved doing it. But it's a really, it, it's a really good way of actually organizing my thoughts. I'm, I normally I'm padding. I've got notebooks full of like crazy, chaotic everything. I do about five lines a page when I get excited. So doing it like this it means that I can really refine it down. We had to watch through 17 hours of footage, 17 hours of interviews, bring it down to the statements that represented that part of the, the narrative. And then, so this is just act one. There are two other parts just as big as this. So let's see. So subtext. No thank you for letting me watch you constantly text as we hang out. I would hate to bore you with my company. This is a, a bugbear of mine. I got really tired of like, trying to talk to people I love and friends and everything. And they're like, yeah, yeah, hold on. I'm just doing this, like they're doing something really important. I'm like, no, no, I'm trying to talk to you. I'm, there's a real physical moment right here happening. And I get, got the feeling a lot of other people are getting this fatigue of staring at too many screens, of trying to communicate with people, to actually communicate the old school way, the first way. And they weren't really listening. And so there was this underlying subtext of, wanting to reject the digital world. And I saw this in so many artists. So many of these guys started out in digital methods and then slowly rejected them because they wanted to do something away from the computers. So this subtext, it was there from the beginning, but appeared whereby we wanted to talk about this tension in the digital world and the analog world. And there's an excerpt I'm just going to show you now that's mainly the pro analog, the pro sort of crafty, hands-on side of the film. I think that if everything that we create, if that just exists in a, a digital cloud, then I think that's an incredible shame. Even if a portion of that is actually a tangible object, then I think that's wonderful. Because we're so used to everything being perfect and things on screen being very seductive and lush and glossy, that when you see something like an old bit of wood with some ink kind of being rolled off a piece of paper, it's got more value to it rather than just knocking something out on the computer. People want things that are handmade. They don't want to go to Ikea and buy a digital print of the wall. They want to go and buy something that someone's handmade and is signed and is original artwork. I also think because a, there is um, a massive amount of um, creative people doing stuff that primarily is just digital and doesn't ever 
become a physical thing. So I think there is a real desire. A, a desire, even for the sanity of the illustrator, to have something that actually can be physical. Otherwise, it's like, what, what, what have they produced? It's a kind of just a little bit of digital data that just gets lost in the ethos of, of the, the world. world, right? <laughs> world. Yeah. Because you've got it in a book and it's printed and you look at it and deliver it and you, you, know, you, you, know, you kind of pour over every page and like, you know, you know, ingest it all. Um, it, kind of, it means more. Maybe I'm saying this is why, you know, why print is still important. It's because you kind of cherish it. You, know, you don't throw away books. You, know, you don't throw away prints. You know, there's something that you keep forever. I guess it's a metaphor for the way the world is now and the, you know, for the sort of digital revolution and the internet. I mean, maybe we need to read more books. Maybe we need to print more books, and make more prints. Everything's, your whole life's on the cloud now and in this, it, it, everything's sort of seemingly invisible. I think it's just sort of data and I think it's kind of really interesting. People are kind of harking back for time when they perhaps thought it was better and it, it wasn't. I mean, no, no time's better than any other time. Once you reach saturation point, people look for something else and people always look to the past for things. It, it, this, maybe it's to do with recession as well and, and there's a nostalgic thing about being in a recession and, and, and needing to kind of strip things back and maybe analogue screen printing, um, sculpture, paper sculpture, um, letterpress, that kind of thing, it, it, it harks back to something. Whoever's making, you know, a, a screen printing artist, a letterpress artist can take today and, and add it to the method and, and make something that's relevant for now. So, no matter how creative you want to be, at some point you're going to need some money. You can't just dream all the time and expect someone else to pick up the bill. So we managed to get so far with some development funding and then we realised that like anybody that pursues any creative endeavour, you're going to have to find a way to fund what you do or not do it. Um, so we thought about initially about corporate sponsorship, we thought initially about sort of trying to do some work to bring in some money, but we thought, as it's so of the time as well, we thought that we would do a Kickstarter. It seemed like a brilliant idea. We just started, we had 200 followers on Twitter, and we were starting to get people to follow us as well as asking them for money at the same time. It's never, it's never good. Um, so, yeah, we, we ran this Kickstarter straight off the back of the edit. There was six weeks of editing. I was there every day for that. And then at the end, we ran the trailer, and it got picked up by the blogs. It got picked up by um, It's Nice That. It got picked up by so many blogs. And within a week, we had 40,000 views. And to us, that was, that was a big deal, because we, didn't, we thought we'd get you know, five or six. And all of a sudden, we were like, well, crap, we've got to actually finish this film off properly. And uh, we're going to need money for music licensing. We're going to need money for uh, grading, making it look beautiful. Uh, we're going to need money for the audio edit. We're going to need money for promoting it. So we started to run this. Nobody knew who we were. We had started to get a few ripples. But after six weeks of this, six weeks of the edit, failing this was just awful. I just, I just wanted to go away and crawl up somewhere and die. I was just like, oh, I've just... Maybe someone doesn't want me to make this, this film. Um, so we had a week off, and then we regrouped, and we talked about it. But I knew in my heart that I just couldn't, you shouldn't give up on things when you know that they are good. So we did end up going back round the houses to corporate, uh, some corporates. Wacom helped us out. We did a load of, um, it, it stretched out the lifetime of how long it took for the film to come out, but we did a load of jobs that brought in money and we just did them absolutely, we did them for nothing. All the money went back into the film and we worked our asses off to try and bring it back again. And off the back of that, we got a film. We got the same week as the Kurt Cobain documentary came out and the Russell Brand film, we got the same amount of stars as them in The Guardian. I never had in a million years would have believed that we would have even had a Guardian review when we started with this pure idea. People collaborated on limited edition prints for fundraising. We, and we've got a film, we've been touring around with it pre its release in October, and people are really excited afterwards. The Q&A session's been going on for like 30, 40 minutes, and it's just been 
so much fun having pushed it. We made so many relationships via the Kickstarter, and all of those people got a thank you anyway on the end, and we're going to send them out a link to it. And it's like, you shouldn't ever let these things sort of put you off pushing further. I mean, it was, I'm so glad that we pushed on and I didn't just give up in that, in that bad week. So this is, the last, this is the last film I'll show, and this one is kind of like an old to new. It's the juxtaposition between talking about the old ways and then actually the truth about the modern age. Well, the tr as far as you can get with editing, because all editing is kind of a lie. So I'll let you watch it, and then we'll talk about it. Well, in the first studio, I was on the dining room table of my girlfriend's house, and you know that was just like cutting things out with a scalpel and uh, kind of sticking things down with prit stick. So yeah, kind of finding places that there weren't the kind of places that there are now. So you'd find like a, a, a corner shop printer. I think where we used to live in Wimbledon, there was a small letterpress printers. So I used to go in there and uh, kind of mess around with this type. When we moved down to Kent, um, it was just complete coincidence that in Rye there's, um, there's still fantastic letterpress printers. So it was, uh, it was complete chance. So when, when I first started working with them, the first project was the work hard and be nice to people poster. They were using letterpress and, and wood type, but you know they, they hadn't printed any kind of larger format posters. Like mo most of the things were, were were quite small. So up until work, when I first started using them, they hadn't used lots of the type. And and there's even now the the fine drawers of type that they'd forgotten they had. You know, Adams has been there for over a hundred years, so. There's lots of nooks and crannies with odd little bits of type tucked away. I was learning Flash and Dreamweaver at GCSE level and I was just like obsessed with Macintosh. I got, an, I, I managed to convince my parents to get me one and I, you know, I had my, had a, like a geo site and like, you know, all were really young. I had no idea really the reality or the real uses of these tools um, or professional uses of these tools, but it was just like a complete playground for me. Like the computer just became something that I couldn't be apart from. We did indulge ourselves in the middle there, quite somewhat. But in the film, it's a, it's a beautiful breathing space in the film. Um, probably gone too now. So, this film is 100% digital, regardless of what the film's about. We couldn't have contacted anybody, we couldn't have edited this film, we couldn't have marketed this film, we couldn't have funded this film. 
were it not for the internet. Everything about this film is 100% digital, apart from the work that you see on the screen. And that's also the tension in the film, is that all of these people make stuff by hand, but were it not for the internet, they would have no audience, no market at all. And that's the thing we explore in the film as well, is that there's this idea, and that's the thing with Molly Makes, and with a lot, you're bringing something from the analog world to your blog, oftentimes, with whether it's, you know, children's clothes or art and craft stuff or anything, anything you bring to your blog tends to be from the analog world. And it's just the best tool in the world for getting things done. The internet, blogs, social media, it's just, we live in a, a really brilliant and exciting time for being able to spread ideas from, from smaller geographies or smaller ideas or niche things can be shared so well. Remember Tom? <laughs> so, hi Tom. Uh, so, it seems like a long time ago now, doesn't it? MySpace. It seems like so long ago. There's the, the myth that people like Lily Allen and Arctic Monkeys found their feet in a marketplace that was empty. They were on MySpace, there was nobody else there. And so, instantly they had a captive audience. All of these people could find them easily. A few years later, totally saturated with music. You couldn't find anything for anything. And I think all these artists originally appeared on the internet. People like Anthony Burrell put up a site in 2000 and then were, ended up working with Kraftwerk. They came to him because they couldn't find any other sites on the internet at that time, probably, something like that. The same with Kate, Kate Moros. She's She started about 2006, 2007, just had a massive online presence. This is pre-smartphones. She really pushed herself out there. Peep Show Collective were in the film. They had a, a brilliant website in 2005 that was this flash website. It took ages to load, but when it did, it was gorgeous. You can find all these things on the Wayback Machine, by the way. Anybody use the Wayback Machine? Yeah. Absolutely brilliant for finding websites from like 2005 that you adored. They're still all there on the Wayback Machine, as long as the page populated enough hits. So that's, I guess how this connects is at the moment, I mean, there's a mid-level amount of, of, of blogs, but it doesn't feel like it's overpopulated with so much content. You're also not dealing with one, one outlet. So MySpace, everything went through MySpace. With blogs, they're all over. You can put them wherever you want. You can find your niche. You're not filtering through someone else's curating. And I feel like it's a really exciting time for sharing ideas until it gets saturated. Hopefully it won't. But I feel like there's a, it's a good time now for sharing your own niche ideas. And our film is a niche idea that finds an audience because we're online. So, this is the old high street. You used to have your butchers, your bakers. I don't ever remember a candlestick maker, ever. <laughs> but there were greengrocers, there were news agents, all of these things, these small businesses that existed. And then the big out-of-town stores came, and they had free parking. And all of a sudden, it was so much more convenient. They had everything. And then they had even stuff that you didn't even realize you wanted. And then slowly, the high street closed down. And I think we're at this stage on the internet now. I think we're at a stage where it's all independent business owners on a digital high street. We're, we all own our own little shops. It's, I think it's so healthy that we're not getting consumed by a bigger machine at the moment. I think this is what, the way I see all of you guys and all of the filmmakers I know and people on YouTube. Everyone's got their own little shop. And it'd be so good if we can maintain that. I mean, I don't know what the digital equivalent of a big out-of-town store with free parking would be, but you need to keep an eye out for it because we're such a healthy world on the internet right now. So, this is going somewhere, I promise. So, when you're a kid, you talk about everything in terms of what you're going to do. It's all definite. I want to be an astronaut. I want to be an artist. I want to be an archaeologist. It's all about what you are definitely going to do. It's a beautiful time. Nothing gets in your way. Absolutely the best time ever. And as you get a bit older, you get a bit distracted, you get a job, you get drunk, you're trying to fall in love, you, you kind of, your dreams, they just get put aside on a little shelf over here. And you occasionally, late at night, you're like, oh, I always wanted to do piano. Like, I'll still do those piano lessons. I'm going to do that life drawing class. Or, you know, I'm, and you tell yourself this, and you carry on living, and then your dreams, you, you move them to a higher shelf. And then you get to a point where you're looking back and you're saying, I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd done that. I shouldn't have stayed in that crappy job so long. Or I should have done 
some watercolour painting, or I don't know. And, and, and that's the saddest thing in the world. There's not much I hate, but what I really do hate is when people moan about stuff all the time. People moan about stuff all the time, and they don't do anything about it. They're just like, oh, I hate my boss, I hate my job. I really always, I want to do this, I want to do that. And so many people, I don't know if they're lazy or they don't have the confidence, they just don't bother. And my mum, obviously my mum looked after me and my brother, so she couldn't grow or prosper much when we were younger. But I hear her talking about all the things she, she wanted to have done in the past. It's all past tense. Even things like going to see Miss Saigon, it's still on. She could go and see it. <laughs> you know, oh, I really wanted to go see Miss Saigon. It's like, no, you can do all these things. Well, most of them to a, to a certain degree. And that's why I hate, I hate when you, people throw their dreams away. There's, you can make an economic decision and a dream-based decision and make them both work for you. It's not just all optimistic sort of idealism. So yeah, this is Anthony Bowe who's in the film. I always love this piece. I saw this about seven years ago and I think this, maybe everything came from this, maybe, I don't know, but it's so true. Someday, someone may make a movie of your life, make sure it doesn't go straight to video. So what you have to ask yourself is, are you going to go make toasters? Do you want to make toasters? Or do you want to walk the less traveled path? So are you doing what you love or just what's expected of you? Thanks very much. So, thank you. Um, yeah, my dog didn't applaud at the end. Uh, so, has anyone got any questions at all? Come on, at least one, just to, there you go. Where can we see the movie? Are you... Pardon? Where can we see the movie, you mean? So, it's a great question. I'm not very good at self-promotion. Um, <laughs> so, in October, we, we are working with a company called R Screen, and they work with picture house cinemas around the country. So what we do is, the site goes on there, they, them and picture house are, are under the same umbrella company. So the film is going up on their site, and what we're going to do is we're going to run screenings around the country where you get a minimum amount of 30 people who subscribe to buy a ticket and the screening goes ahead. So we're doing that, we're going to push each and we're going to try and partner with people. We're going to look at people like Pinterest or Etsy or Folksy and try and get, because I know a lot of those have regional groups, and try and get regional groups to maybe put events on. That's going to run for two weeks. We're also doing a screening with the guys that run Offset, one at the Arnold Feeney in Bristol. And so in October, I think from the 14th through, we're going to do two weeks of screenings and then we're going to release on demand, on Vimeo on demand. Um, and possibly do a limited Blu-ray or DVD release. I'm not sure if people still buy Blu-rays or DVDs. But yeah, so, is that, yeah? Thank you. In relation to the failure of your Kickstarter yeah. and then, like, obviously having to find other avenues, do you think it was more satisfying in the end because you ended up, like, working for it yourself rather than, I don't know, like some people... I have an issue with Kickstarter about, you know, expecting people to give you money to do something, whereas, yeah, not everyone can... If you're not popular enough or you don't have the audience, not everyone can do a Kickstarter, you know. I, I absolutely think... That, in fact, actually, Connor and I, we did loads of on online tutorials. We taught ourselves how to grade weeks and weeks of learning how to grade, of how, how to make sure the audio was all like, EQ'd properly. We continued our relationship with these people. The artists did collaborative prints. It was so much more rewarding. Also, the thing about Kickstarter is obviously you have to give a percentage to Kickstarter, and then you have to pay a certain amount on postage, and then a certain amount on creating the actual the things you want to share. And I, I'm a stationary freak. I love prints and stuff, so I would have loved to have made all that stuff. But Dave, our producer, was there going, you know what, like... We're going to spend eight, eight grand. In fact, actually, that would have totaled our... We would have got our amount if we didn't have to create all that stuff. And part of me wants to do that. But I don't have Dave here right now to rein me in and tell me that I shouldn't. That's what a producer should do. But I, it was so much more rewarding. And we've got lasting relationships with all those people. Um, it's almost a shame there's no forum where you can just go on there and say, we don't want any money, but what can we do as a community to help make this happen? Who can help who out... And how can we make this eventually benefit us all without anybody taking advantage of anybody else? I 
I'm very curious about, in your course of a year of interviewing all of these artists, what percentage of those people, or roughly, were interested in learning new skills that were analog versus digital? Because I'm from the US, and I'm sort of watching the maker community, and I'm so surprised to see this kind of next generation of makers much more interested in learning digital skills, whether it's like Photoshop and Illustrator and things like that, versus going back and learning like old school printmaking. Did you see people trying to reach out to learn either the analog or new skills? That's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting point. I mean, I think, I think a lot of people are reaching, because I, I really know Illustrator and all that stuff really well, and I think they're starting to reach into new technologies. There's a lot of people doing animation, doing filmmaking. I've heard so many people talk about film is, video is what's going to be, it's so immediate that people are learning video. So I'm knowing, I'm knowing a lot of people who are learning video editing, they're learning how to make films or animation, all of that kind of stuff, a lot of 3D type and 3D modeling. And it's an exciting time. I mean, the film really only explores one certain, one specific niche. But what I'm seeing online is so much brilliant 3D typography that looks really natural. It doesn't look kind of garish. So I'm seeing a lot of um, people turning back to that. But in this film, a lot of people had turned away from it because they had experienced too much of it. But yeah. Thank you. Um, that film just, oh, when all the printmaking just got me quite emotional. <laughs> um, someone who's um, come up through print and um, um, is primarily a print journalist. Um, I think it's a, a beautiful um, conversation you started here because I think what people can lose sight of in the digital world is, is that a lot of the old skills are still relevant. You know, really good quality journalism, um, really good quality photography, um, the craft behind things. Um, just because it's in a digital format doesn't mean to say that um, it's you don't need the skills in the first place. People, not everyone can produce these things. It, it takes creative people. Um, it takes people who have got skills and have learned skills and have spent time learning skills. And um, I really hope that you can grow this message and this is just the beginning because I think it's a really, really important thing to teach people. Um, and, you know, maybe in long term you can get these out through schools and colleges, your message, because I think it's um, a really important lesson. So I just want to say thanks. Thank you. We're <laughs> we, are, we are talking with a lot of universities about showing it in universities. Um, one thing I'll say just, just quickly is um, John Bergman in the film says... Um, it doesn't matter whether you're using a digital or an analog tool. The fact is, if you've got no ideas, then, then they're both useless. So, you know, it's the ideas that matter, you know, not, the, not what you do with them. And also, I think, what, one thing just quickly, I think um, it's a cell memory thing to me. So this is me looking at websites. This is me making a magazine. This is me doing illustration work. But this is me doing a screen print. This is me riding a bike. I don't know, this is me live drawing. And there's a cell memory we have for all of these other things we do. So if you get away from the computer, you're not just remembering everything as this movement. You're actually doing things that create a different memory. And I think that's really vital to mental health in many respects. Actually doing something where your body is doing a different thing to what you do all day. You may as well just be looking at an Excel spreadsheet, just rolling and rolling and rolling all day, because it's the same movement across the board. It's the doing, and it, it, is, it is the ideas, but it's also the... The process of learning the skill to be able to then execute the idea. So a printmaker, you know, might have brilliant visual ideas, but they have to learn how to use the paint, how to use the tools, and I think it's that process that's really, um, you know, important. Uh, absolutely. Hi. Um, I don't know if it's been brought up in other topics, but um, I was thinking about your ethics when you're been making the film and you've been talking about production. I know in my work it's about sustainability, paying people what you can. Um, and I curated a film festival recently and we realised we were showing films through the picture house that don't pay the living wage. Okay. And I wonder how you factor that in the kind of work that you do or how we all do our work because sometimes we do stuff for free, sometimes we work with people that maybe are different from us. What, how, how do you make that work for you? So. We we always knew, I mean, from my background as well, I mean, I saw people being walked on all the time. My mum was walked on all the time. She worked for Tesco for 17 years, absolutely walked all over, especially at the end. And so when we made this film, the only people that got walked all over financially were me, Dave, and Connor. 
but just there's not everybody else got paid and that's why we'd had to do the kickstarts we had to pay someone to do a score for us we had to we paid the dop we paid everybody because you ca you can't carry something creative and beautiful with you if you know that you've trod on people to get there we were with um, we were in Norwich last week at a screening. There's a guy called Creative Giant who put on a screening at the uni, and it was 200 people, and we had a really amazing Q&A. And while we were talking that day, he came up with this phrase just out of the blue, where it's, it's better to walk with people than to walk all over them. Straight away, he put it up on his, on his design site, and I, I thought that's a really good way to live your life. So I totally agree, and I'll look into the picture house thing, because our screen works with independent cinemas across the country, and they're not just picture house, but it is an affiliated uh, um, picture house production. So I'll look into that as well. Thank you so much, Anthony. That was amazing. Anthony, oh, yeah, Anthony Peters. <laughs> I nearly called you Anthony Burrell. Like. <laughs> Anthony Peters. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Let me just get a picture of you all. Just for my memory, because this is like by far the most terrifying, daunting <laughs> thing I've done in a long time. So, can everybody just wave, maybe? Yay! There you go, perfect. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you, Thank you Anthony. Oh, amazing.